<laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I think we should get going. Before I introduce Professor Matthias, uh, and he's a professor of computer science at UC Santa Cruz, uh, let me make a couple of other introductions. Uh, my name is Paul Wright. I'm the acting director of Citrus, and I'd like to welcome you to the Citrus Research Exchanges, which are every Wednesday at noon. And they are sponsored by a company called Infineon that uh, help us set up all these web services and uh, buy the lunches and, and help sometimes if we're bringing a speaker from far away. And that is a caution I wanted to mention to you. This is being webcast. Our other three uh, universities at Davis, Santa Cruz, and Merced are watching right now. And so then I always make the little joke, if you don't mind, that be careful how you're eating because you're on TV and you don't want... Um, sandwich to run down your face while you're on the television. Uh, the, and so hello to our web viewers that are out there, and it's wonderful that each week the, the web audience uh, seems to increase. This, uh, this particular talk to kick off the semester, as you can see, uh, is to do with the future of games. There are many people in this audience, uh, Professor Barsky, Sakan, and Professor Niemeyer, uh, to name only a few that are especially interested in this topic. It's a, a very nice intersection of Citrus uh, technology with a really important social element. Um, Professor Matthias uh, has his research at, at Santa Cruz in this area of artificial intelligence-based art and entertainment. Uh, he was a, uh, previously a, a faculty member at Georgia Institute of Technology where he held a joint appointment, which I find really very interesting. It makes him sound very sophisticated, between the <laughs> College of Computing and the School of Literature. I think we should try and get something going like that at Berkeley. It sounds very, very sophisticated. And then finally, uh, he has a very important uh, AI-based interactive drama, which was release, released sorry, with his colleague Andrew Stern in July 2005. So without further ado, let's get going. Uh, there'll be some questions at the end. We'll try and stop at uh, about uh, uh, 12.50 for those questions. And in our usual style, let's uh, please welcome Professor Matthias with a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Glad to be here today. Uh, can everyone hear me? Is that volume fine? OK, cool. All right. Um, so what I want to talk about today is how games are becoming a new and powerful mode of expression moving beyond entertainment, though I certainly love entertainment gaming, but moving far beyond entertainment to almost um, every area of discussion in society. Um, and that story starts with observing how gaming has really become a mass medium. You know, so there's this old stereotype of video games as the obsession of potentially nerdy teenage boys. Um, well, this is really no longer true. And I'm sorry for repeating these. These are very sort of oftenly cited statistics, and you probably all know them. But I think they bear worth repeating. Now, the average age of game players is now 35. 40% of all game players are women. 26% of Americans over age 50 have played video games, up from 9% in 1999. 33% um, of all game players are women over 18. To compare that with 18% of game players are boys age 17 or younger. So um, the demographics of games have, have definitely changed uh, dramatically, and the scope of games, it's of course a $10 billion a year industry now, has uh, changed dramatically from this sort of uh, stereotype of you know, the nerdy boys in the basement. Games are also regularly discussed in mainstream culture. Those of you who might have caught the big spread on Spore, the upcoming game from Will Wright at EA, in the New York Times yesterday. It was sort of like a, uh, almost a full page at the front of the science section of the New York Times. Um, and you see sort of that kind of coverage regularly now of the gaming universe. So I think we can all agree, OK, it's, it's sort of a mass medium now. It's not kind of a niche phenomenon. Further, games are um, not restricted to sort of mere entertainment. And I put mere in scare quotes because, as I said, I, I feel like um, art and, uh, and entertainment are fine goals in their own right. Um, however, there are a number of people um, recently, and by recently I mean over the last sort of five to seven years, who have um, really begun exploring games as a powerful and immersive and high agency way to really deliver almost any kind of content. 
really um, the, the experiment here and the, the design approach people are taking are to express content as rule systems. And that what really makes games a powerful medium is that it allows players to experientially experiment with rule systems. So if you can sort of figure out how to turn your content into a rule system, um, uh, now you've got an extremely powerful way to sort of communicate that content to other people. Um, and so you see games becoming a medium for education and training. And of course, you know, training games and education games are becoming fairly common now, um, but uh, sort of a little less common, but very interesting. Uh, games are being used for public policy debate to, uh, uh, to look at sort of the implications in game form of various potential, say, pieces of legislation. Uh, games are being used for editorial commentary. There's sort of a budding uh, genre called news games, which are kind of the game equivalent of editorial cartoons. Um, games are being used for documentary now. Uh, there's sort of a, a growing and, and powerful movement in what's called docu-gaming, um, and often sort of games that um, critically explore their topic and allow, the, uh, and allow the player to critically explore that topic again by actually experimenting with a rule system. So the McDonald's game is a good example uh, that uh, is a game critical of the sort of corporate practices of McDonald's and allows the player to directly experiment with the relationship between sort of you know, policies in the rainforest, uh, policies in McDonald's uh, um, uh, 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 boardroom. Um, uh, issues of sort of obesity and class with sort of who goes to McDonald's and finally um, uh, issues for workers who are working in McDonald's restaurants and what this little sort of docu game lets you do is sort of experiment with how all of those diff distinct sort of domains intersect. So um, the big question that I want to explore in this talk today is how AI can be used to further the expressive potential of games. So we have games being used for the sort of you know, richer and richer, um, uh, uh, richer and richer forms of really public discussion. And that's what's really, I think, exciting about games is they're becoming a dominant medium and perhaps the dominant medium of the 20, 21st century. The sort of everything that you currently read in newspapers, that you experience in novels, that you see in plays, that you see in cinema will also be available in game form. Um, however, there are some limits on currently on what's possible to express in games and my strong belief and what drives much of my research is that um, uh, work in artificial intelligence and in particularly game AI can open up the expressive potential of games. So for the rest of the talk I really want to look at two examples of how kind of AI driven research and design can open up expressive spaces of games, make possible games that sort of weren't possible f before. Uh, the first example I'm going to talk about is interactive drama, um, which is, you know, the, the, the concept behind interactive drama is autonomous characters with rich personality and emotion who you interact with sort of on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And as you interact with them, you experience a dynamically constructed storyline, not a pre-scripted or branching storyline, but a dynamically constructed storyline that um, depends on the details of all the decisions you make as a player. Uh, the second area I'm going to talk about, and I'm, I'm going to talk about interactive drama somewhat briefly. I know a number of people in this audience have probably already seen talks of mine on facade, and since it did come out in 2005, um, I've given many talks <laughs> between sort of 2004 and now on facade. So I'm going to try to keep that part of the talk short and then spend the remainder on um, uh, some newer work going on in my group on automated game design support. And this is uh, sort of building systems that support novice and expert game designers um, and that also enable radically new customized games, games that are sort of customized and targeted to individual players. So first, uh, um, Facade and Interactive Drama. So Facade is an interactive drama that um, Andrew Stern and I released in 2005. Uh, where we really wanted to kind of push the boundary on this old holodeck dream that you know Brenda Laurel had written about it in her dissertation work um, in the 80s. Um, the idea had sort of been around you know somewhat before that, though Brenda Laurel is the one who actually coined the term interactive drama. Um, during my graduate work at Carnegie Mellon, I was a member of a group called the Oz Project that was uh, one of the first AI research groups to kind of explore this idea of building autonomous, believable agents and interactive story systems. Um, and so Facade was, uh, was our attempt to try to at least build an existence proof that, uh, that it was possible to create dynamically constructed stories and rich and interactive personalities. Uh, so before I go further, I'd like to just show a video demo. Um, this is freely downloadable at interactivestory.net. I do have uh, 
So if you want to want to check it out, we've had about 800,000 downloads so far. So the game's been getting out there, um, been broadly discussed in the blogosphere, et cetera. So, uh, which was one of our goals was also to uh, try to shed some light on the endless debate of games versus narrative uh, that sort of you know plagues game design. All right, so to set up facade a little bit, um, all you're told in the backstory when you play is that um, you've been invited over to a couple's house for dinner, Grace and Trip. Um, you know, you're told that you knew them, say, 10 years ago when you were in college. You haven't seen them since. That's the only uh, backstory you're given. Unbeknownst to you, at least the first time you play, Trip and Grace's marriage is in serious trouble. And in fact, tonight's the night uh, it's all going to explode and kind of how it explodes and how they feel about each other and how they feel about you, the player, depends on how you interact through the rest of the, the experience. Um, so you can kind of think of it as the game version of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, right? Except uh, with um, one visitor instead of two visitors at the door. Uh, the, b before I sort of roll the little video, I do want to point out like the, the, the sort of sequences of conversations you see, you know, the, the physical actions they're taking are not pre-scripted. This is all being sort of, you know, dynamically generated by the AI system, which I'm going to discuss a little bit. Uh, the natural language understanding you see, you'll see the character, uh, the player type to talk to the characters as well as sort of gesture with the cursor to perform various expressive gestures. Um, that's not just sort of keyword look, out, look up, we're actually doing parsing, um, producing discourse acts. The discourse acts go to a conversation manager that's actually keeping track of the open conversational threads, choosing among possible responses, uh, et cetera. Um, so I, I just want to point out this isn't uh, kind of, you know, like a bunch of pre-scripted animations that we're sequencing or something. The facial animations are completely procedural. There's no canned animation. That's just being generated on the fly and driven by the AI architecture. Andrew! Did you turn ah, up the volume so a little bit? you could make it. We haven't seen you in so long. How's it going, man? Oh, we're great. I mean, really, really great. Come on in. Andrew. Hi, how are you? Oh, it's so nice to see you. It so in this like uh, trailer, forever. we've just cut yeah, together how, snippets how of doing? different players playing. Uh, and so that's why you that. see those black wipes between well, snippets. I can ask him too. <sighs> oh. <laughs> and I've got to say, you look really good. Well, it's funny how after a full day's work designing magazine ads, Grace finds the time to decorate and redecorate. <laughs> I guess it's just the artist in me dying to get out. You know, for this corner of the room, I had a desire for something big and bold. Yeah, this is a huge couch. <sighs> Thank you. I knew you'd give me an honest okay. answer. It's just... Decorating, for Christ's sake, you're turning it into something. You know, Trip, if you hadn't convinced me to go into advertising, I could have painted that painting on the wall instead of buying it. That's the problem with this goddamn apartment. Lousy acoustics. And then Grace buys all of this ridiculously expensive furniture that just sucks up your voice when you're talking. I feel like someone's muffling me when I sit on her new couch. See, Grace, as always, you're the only one unhappy with your decorating. Right, I know. I'll never be satisfied with it. I shouldn't get so obsessed about it. It's just not worth it. Ugh, where's my drink? Oh, hey, you're hugging me. <laughs> oh, that's nice of you. Grace, aren't you glad we invited him over? <clears throat> Turn up the thermostat if we're going to talk about sex. <laughs> Trip, no, that's not funny. Come on. <laughs> Andrew, you know that flirting with me is only going to make me wish I'd married you instead of Trip. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, okay, that's enough, you two lovebirds. <laughs> okay, Andrew, I think this evening is over. You've got to leave. There's only so much you can expect to put up with, you know? Oh, no. Andrew, I just realized. I'm sorry. What? I haven't gotten us drinks. When it comes to drinking, I have the simplest tastes. I'm uh, always satisfied with the best. So, what's your poison? Can I interest you in a single malt scotch? It's primo. I served them at our last party. They were a smash. 
Martinis. Perfect. Classic. Great idea. Well, it didn't take long for you two to bond or whatever. Trip thinks he's at his classiest when he's on the serving end of a swizzle stick. Why don't I make us one of my new drink inventions? I call it Grace's Inner Soul. It's a mixture of Chardonnay, bitters, and lots of ice. Um, All right. I think now, we'll stop there. Um, so this gives uh, <laughs> this gives some sense of kind of possible pro uh, progressions through the experience. Um, facades intended to be replayed multiple times. In fact, to completely understand sort of the situation and the backstory, you have to replay it multiple times and play with different strategies, kind of interaction and social strategies, in order to kind of uncover, you know, Grace's point of view, Tripp's point of view, explore um, the different possible endings. And you know, again, the endings are kind of selected as a function of your interaction history, not of some like you know single uh, branch point. Um, we don't set up any particular goal for the player. We're not saying that. Uh, the goal is that you should try to keep them together or break them apart or whatever. We, we, want, you know, we want to allow the player to kind of pick a goal for themselves and then pursue it in this context. So um, really, if you look at you know, interactive drama as kind of a design and technology research question, uh, there's really two parts to any drama, right? Character and story. Um, so on the story side, you know, story is not just kind of a causally connected sequence. It has more to that. You know, if it was just a causally connected sequence, then you could talk about the exciting story of the spring, right? That you, you expand it and then it you know, goes in and it comes out and it goes in and it comes out and there's all kinds of nice causality there. Well, that's not a story, even though it's a causal sequence. Um, there actually is a, a, a strong temporal structure that has to uh, exist on a... Uh, on a sequence of events in order to really be a story. This is Aristotelian structure, and this is what we explicitly sought in facade, was to try to kind of recapitulate an Aristotelian plot arc. You know, I mean, if you're used to sort of standard kind of mainstream cinema, is all Aristotelian and follows this kind of plot arc. There are many other potential story structures. I mean, the whole history of narrative and drama in the 20th century has basically been about doing things different than this, right? But um, we purposely, for Facade, um, set out to, uh, to try to recapitulate and um, produce this, this Aristotelian tight sense of plot arc. Um, you also need characters. Um, you know, can characters, you know, what, 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 do character, what does it mean to be a character? Well, they have consistency, they have inner life, um, they really have personalities, emotions, self-motivation, change, you know, and all of this kind of adds up to create the illusion of life. You have to somehow bring the character to life, and our approach in Facade, and really building on the approach of the Oz Project, was to say, let's look to the character arts. Uh, the character arts have been creating the illusion of life for a long time. Um, so how can we take sort of, in a sense, the craft rules of thumb from the character arts and build AI architectures that do that autonomously? Um, I, I'm just going to give a really brief kind of overview of the technical uh, infrastructure of Facade. There's, of course, uh, a really interesting design story in Facade as well. It was, it was sort of combining technology research and design research to figure out how to build a game-like experience where the interaction is fundamentally social. Right, where it's not movement-based, it's not about movement and collision detection, it's about social interaction. And that, that was really sort of a combination of technical and design work. I'm going to focus um, in this little brief uh, interlude on facade on the technical infrastructure. So the major pieces are, of course, you know, there's a story world with behavior-based agents. Um, so Trip and Grace are implemented as two sort of asynchronous, autonomous, uh, behavior-based ag agents. Um, and I'll talk about the behavior architecture uh, uh, shortly. There's a drama manager where the drama manager kind of has a bag of um, dramatic beats. And we take this notion of beats from the theory of dramatic writing. A beat is kind of the smallest unit of interaction, um, of, of dramatic interaction that causes some kind of value change. Uh, so dramatic values are things like love, trust, hate, tension. Um, and so there's some number, there's you know, desired value arcs that the artist, that the author of this story wants to make happen. There's a bag of beats you can use to kind of sequence sort of units of dramatic action that are then going to be carried out by these autonomous characters and kind of as a function of an episodic history of everything that's happened so far in the story, um, the drama manager decides amongst its kind of bag of you know, dramatic uh, 
you know, tricks in the sense that it has these beats, which one to instantiate next and to tell the autonomous characters to try to carry out. And finally, there's a natural language processing subsystem that, as I mentioned, you know, has sort of two phases. One, a, uh, a, a kind of a parse that goes from surface text to discourse acts. It's really um, what I guess I'd call pr pragmatic parsing, comparing it to like old Schenkian uh, uh, semantic uh, uh, parsing, which tries to go directly from some sort of surface text to semantics without going through a lot of intermediate syntax. Um, or minimizing the amount of syntax that goes through. Here, we're doing the same thing, except we're not going to uh, semantics, we're going to pragmatics. So everything that the surface, the natural language processing system is sort of hearing when you type are social moves, like flirt, agree, disagree, oppose, you know, refer to topic, so forth. Um, and then finally, given the discourse act, and often usually multiple acts are recognized by one utterance, uh, then picking a reaction, which has to be somehow sequenced into the ongoing beat that's being uh, performed by the characters. So that just gives you a flavor of the, the interplay between the major components uh, behind facade. Um, the agents are written in a language called ABLE that stands for A Behavior Language. Um, and this is, for those of you who have done any work on sort of reactive execution, this is very much a, a BDI style architecture. So if you've played with PRS or RAPS, you know, some of these early original uh, um, reactive execution frameworks, ABLE builds on that, uh, on that history, though uh, ABLE has been specifically designed to support authoring autonomous characters. So a lot of the language constructs reactive annotations and so forth have been designed with building autonomous characters in mind and specifically supporting that. So for example, um, joint intentionality is uh, primitive in the language. So if you want a team of your actors basically to engage in some kind of synchronized performance while at the same time performing all kinds of other things in parallel, uh, that's just, you, you get that in a sense for free uh, as a joint intentionality framework that's built into ABLE. Which, of course, you know, for those of you who have looked at joint intentionality theories, you know, there's a lot of kind of hairy multi-phase commit issues, and you have to somehow work in this multi-phase commit in the face of performing a lot of reactive execution on the current active behavior tree, et cetera. This is the intention structure for the agent. Uh, similar to kind of a call stack, except it's a tree instead of a stack, because uh, parallelism, um, like as, as is ca the case for any sort of BDI architecture, parallelism is also primitive in the architecture. Basically, uh, uh, characters need to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. <laughs> so you need, you need uh, methods for authoring uh, independent behaviors that then dynamically mix at runtime. As a concrete example of that, um, you know, Trip uh, tends to like to make drink, drinks for the player behind the bar, and there's a, a behavior hierarchy that's just all about the mechanical process of making drinks, you know, navigating behind the bar, fiddling with things, asking the player what drink they want, continuing to make it, then hunting the player down and trying to offer the drink to them. Where, where do you put the drink if the player doesn't take it, et cetera? So there's sort of a whole bunch of competencies, in a sense, that are just related to making drinks. Uh, there are other competencies related to arguing about specific topics. So when he's behind the bar making the drink, in parallel, you know, who knows where the story is, right? It depends on what the drama manager's been driving. So while I'm, uh, while Tripp's making drinks, all these other, say, you know, argue about topic X behaviors are mixing in on top of it. And so the job of ABLE is to make that mix in sort of, you know, look good, perform flawlessly, not conflict with each other. So, you know, if the argument behavior wants to shake its fist angrily while delivering a line, but your hand's busy pouring a drink, then you have to reason about that body resource conflict and decide, um, well, can I use an eyebrow? Does that have enough sort of expressive affordance to, to indicate the amount of displeasure I have? Or do I need to set down the drink first, shake my fist, then continue? So those are the kinds of issues. Uh, Briefly, I mean, I could give a whole talk on ABLE, but those are the kinds of issues that sort of ABLE resolves for us in a reactive execution framework. Now, you know, if you um, are used to, you know, papers you've read on reactive executors, you know, they tend to be set in little grid worlds and they have, you know, a dozen behaviors and, you know, and the active behavior, uh, the active uh, intention tree maybe has three or four goals that are being pursued at the same time. Uh, in facade, a, a character snapshot is actually much more complicated than that. You know, in a typical snapshot, there are dozens of parallel goals. We're pulling 200 plus decision cycles a second, which means you're sort of iterating the entire tree, trying to decide what makes the most sense out of all the things you could do next to pursue next while mixing in multiple behaviors. We're doing that a couple hundred times a second. Um, there's hundreds of working memory elements, modulating behavior, et cetera. And so 
part of what we also did with ABLE was, in a sense, the engineering work of scaling reactive execution up beyond the sort of toy examples that it's often sort of demonstrated in to something with a lot of kind of complex state that's being maintained at runtime. Um, the other piece I want to talk about briefly is drama management or story management. Uh, so obviously, um, explicitly authored branching stories are kind of the enemy here. You know, and this is the standard in the game industry. Actually, the explicitly authored story is usually a linear sequence in commercial games with maybe a teeny amount of branching that comes back to the spine, the linear sequence. Why do they do that? Well, because as, you know, if you think about it for three seconds, you realize that um, authoring branching stories is an exponential explosion. Right? That there's an exponential amount of content you'd have to author if you really wanted to offer many interaction opportunities. Um, since in practice, having, you know, as an author, creating some complex story graph is just in practice too hard, people don't do it. And so drama management as a general problem is really the problem of how can we get rid of this, still allow sort of human authorship, but have this in some sense be dynamically constructed. And the general approach in drama management is if we take the nodes of a story graph, the nodes you can think of are kind of the units of content. In facade, those would be beats, right? But these could be scenes, these could be individual lines of dialogue, these could be, you know, it depends on your story what your sort of units of storiness are. But you take these units of storiness, put them in a story library, unlinked, and then somehow author a selection policy. So you're turning sort of a story graph into really a policy problem, right? So turn this into a selection policy that given the actual sequence so far that's happened in the story world, that sort of trajectory, the story trajectory the player's been on so far, pick the, the, the next piece, story piece to sequence that sort of makes the most sense, whatever that means, makes the most sense given your selection policy. And of course, if I ran this selection policy over all possible story prefixes, I could reconstruct this. Right? But the idea is, why doesn't the system reconstruct this? Since this is hard for human beings to author, um, why not let the system worry about all the sort of hairy interdependencies between story pieces? And um, I, as an author, can just create the sort of units of content, whatever, you know, whatever granularity that is, I want to happen. So um, this is not even an architecture. This would be sort of like an architecture schema or something or a problem description. Um, we've played with a number of ways of instantiating this notion of drama management. Um, one approach that we used in Facade was this kind of probabilistic agenda mechanism that I'm not going to talk about today. I want to briefly talk about another one that we've been exploring the last couple of years, which is to really pose this as an optimization problem. Um, and there are a number of ways to solve this optimization problem. And in fact, we have actually used Game Tree Search, as is, uh, as is shown here. Um, and we found ways to kind of make it scale. But you can also think of this Game Tree Search statement of the problem as kind of the, the abstract statement. And you could come up with other ways to try to solve this optimization. So in this optimization framework, uh, what you as an author has to have to provide are sort of the plot points, the kind of major significant incidents that are kind of like the signposts along the way of your story. Um, and these major significant incidents may be at a much higher level of granularity than individual player interaction. So you might have, you know, like, you know, if it's a, a murder mystery story, um, receive a clue about something, right? And you, you receive a clue about the, uh, the identity of the murderer. Now, that the actual amount of running around you did in the world to receive that clue might have been like five minutes of running around and opening doors and exploring or whatever. Um, and then, you know, ah, you got the clue. Okay, now a plot point's happened now the drama manager would spring into to action. So you can think of this as you can author these at whatever level of granularity you want, but they're generally above the level of individual player actions, sort of walking around, moving, talking. Um, you have some number of story moves that can warp the story world. Uh, you can think of story moves as things like uh, remove an object from a room and place it in a different room. Give an autonomous character a goal. Um, make a certain, you know, lock a door so that it's impossible for the player to proceed along that part of the world, right? So these are all these sort of tricks for manipulating the world around the player that the, uh, that the system has. And then you give it an evaluation function, which given a totally ordered story, a totally ordered sequence of plot points, returns a value on how good a story that is. And we've come up with various uh, idioms for how you author these evaluation functions. Now, these are, these are story specific. This isn't some universal model of story goodness. This is basically something an author creates for a particular story world. Now, um, given a sequence that's happened so far, your problem as a drama manager is 
how should I warp the world next? What story move should I do next? Or nothing, you know, one choice is always nothing. So that in all the possible projected futures, I maximize my expected value of this evaluation function. Right? So I'm trying to do something now that'll make it more likely that in the future a good story will happen. So one way to do that, if you pose it as a, a game tree search problem, is you imagine making all your possible next story moves. And then you have a player model, and a, a model of sort of how the player behaves in your story world, and you imagine some distribution over next plot points that can happen for each of those story moves. And then you imagine all the story moves you could do after that, and so forth. When you project this out, any one uh, trace through this tree gives you a totally ordered sequence. Now you can evaluate it, you've got a goodness for that story, you back it up using expect a max, so you don't do min max because you're, you're not, your model of the player is not that the player is trying to make the worst story possible happen, right? So it's a kind of, it's not an adversarial search, so you're, you, we use an expect a max backup and there's other things you could play with with that, but we expect a max backup and voila, you've got uh, numbers on your evaluation numbers on your next story moves, you pick the highest one. So this is one way to sort of pose drama management as an evaluation problem. There's other, there's some uh, uh, trajectory distribution sort of, there's ways we viewed it as an MDT, an MDP problem, except that your nodes are trajectories rather than individual states. Basically your states are trajectories. So there's a TDD MDP formulation of this we've played with. Um, there's various sort of reinforcement learning, you know, a la TD Lambda uh, approaches we've used for playing with this. Um, but we've actually found that um, this is uh, actually literally doing the game tree search tends to be much more stable than using TD Lambda uh, sort of reinforcement learners because you inevitably have to do function approximation uh, somewhere in the guts of it. The state space is too big and you run into um, really bad stability problems. Um, so, which is, I mean, a known problem uh, in TD Lambda work. So uh, I wanted to give this just as an example of how you can take this notion of making you know, a good story happen for the player, which sounds really kind of um, abstract and vague, and how could you possibly turn that into kind of a well-posed AI problem? And well, here's one way you turn it into a well-posed AI problem. But once you have a framework like this, you can start imagining game designs that you wouldn't even consider making unless you had something like this. You know, you tend to, as game designers, uh, we tend to be limited in our thinking about the possibility space of game designs by the technical tools we have at our, um, at our uh, 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 disposal. And so if all you've got available are sort of scripts and triggers, which would be the standard for like sto you know, RPG story games, for example. Scripts and triggers are basically your entire bag of tricks for trying to create you know, multi-path stories. Um, there's no way you would imagine stories with the kind of richness of interaction possibilities at the story levels if you're thinking in terms of script and triggers versus this. With this, you can sort of imagine um, much richer possibility spaces for uh, dynamic story arcs. So that's, that's what's kind of exciting about this sort of work as we tend to, you know, like right now, we've actually built an, a, kind of a simple experimental game using drama management to kind of test, you know, what sort of design affordances open up. What does this allow us to do as authors that would have been intractable using a script and trigger system? Um, and also, of course, uh, player studies of do players notice the difference with the drama manager turned on and off? Do they like it better when the drama manager's turned on? So there's a lot of sort of uh, HCI style work that we're doing now that we have kind of a, a basic framework that we, that we like. All right, um, so shifting gears uh, for the next uh, uh, 10 minutes or so, so I'm gonna touch on this uh, briefly, um, is the current support we're doing on automated game design. Um, so what is an automated game designer? It really reasons about game mechanics, representations, and player input devices to answer questions about a game design or automatically generate a game design. So this is something that's actually reasoning about the, um, is reasoning about the game mechanics themselves. And it constitutes an operational theory of game design. So I want to contrast this with level generation. Level generation is, um, a part of game design and sort of procedural level generators have been around since uh, Rogue and NetHack days, right? Um, but they tend to use uh, what's you know, called random generation, which means you just sort of randomly plunk down randomly sized rooms so that they don't interlap, um, overlap and then connect them with paths. And that constitutes your level generation. And then you have distributions over objects and encounters and you sort of plunk them down in rooms and that's all you do. 
Um, and those of you who have spent time playing Rogue or NetHack uh, back in the day or maybe currently um, will recall that you would often run into like unwinnable levels, right? <laughs> Where it's just, it's created a level, there's no way to get through it without dying. Um, but that, you know, that, that was sort of, and, and, and still to some degree is, even in games like Diablo 3, the current state of level generation. But what I want to do with game generation is something far deeper than this, because when you do level generation, you're still assuming your game mechanics stay constant. You know, what the rules of the game are, basically the state evolution rules for the game remain constant. What I'm interested in building are systems that reason about the state evolution rules themselves and help designers think through the consequences of different game design decisions. You know, it's also different from things like Scalable City, which is another you know, form of procedural content generation. So why would you want to do automated game generation? You know, what, what would inspire you to do this research? Uh, well, for one thing, you could help novice designers. You know, many people want to build small, express, or, or informative games. So here's a news game called Madrid that was built after the Madrid train bombing. Um, in which, you know, I remember some large number of people died in that Madrid subway. Um, and this was sort of a memorial game, basically, that came out uh, two or three days after uh, the Madrid bombing happened. A game design team in Uruguay basically stayed up for a weekend to build a uh, sort of a memorial response to that incident. So there's an example of a news game. This is actually the McDonald's docu game and the sort of four different mini games you play. Um, in, the, in the McDonald's docu-game. So these would be examples of people, of, of sort of small, expressive, or informative games where there's actually some real-world content you're trying to convey as a rule system. And, you know, I tend to get, um, you know, several cold calls a month, you know, from people who just, you know, hunt me down and find my number and say, oh, I'm interested in building this game on bicycle safety. You know, can you help me? You know, I'm interested in a game uh, that could, you know, intervene in gang issues in L.A. You know, can you help me? And, that's, and so there's all these people out there who realize that games are a powerful form for expressing their message, but they have no game design skills. Right? So how do you start building a game? Um, and they're usually dismayed when they start hearing what the costs of even a simple game are. Uh, so, um, if you could build something that would be kind of the equivalent of like Game Maker or Alice, you know, these are assistants for game implementation, but they don't help with design. Game Maker and Alice are kind of like, um, you know, particularly Game Maker is kind of like a widget set for the fundamental widgets of games, and you can script behaviors for games, but it's not like Game Maker knows anything about what constitutes a good game and what mechanics are and how mechanics interact and how, and how you might map different mechanics onto your content. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't know anything about that. So that's the part, like, you know, I would like to add that kind of smarts, in a sense, to tools like GameMaker. So this would be one motivation for looking at this kind of automated uh, support, um, uh, automated game design support work. Another is to make prototypes more informative, even for expert designers. So, you know, the, the, the current uh, wave in uh, contemporary game design is that you do a lot of rapid prototyping of the mechanics. And these are prototypes of the sort of boxes and circles variety. Um, these are actually two prototypes from Spore. So Spore, uh, um, you know, the game that I mentioned that was in the New York Times that comes out September 7th. Um, uh, in Spore, they literally produced, you know, over a hundred of these kinds of prototypes, uh, these sort of boxes and circles prototypes. This was an economy prototype. They just wanted to play around with the raw mechanics of their economy system, stripping away all the graphics and all the sort of rest of the game experience. Just what are the, what's the raw rule system of the economy system look like? Does it feel good? Does it have the right kinds of behaviors in terms of how hard it is to achieve certain amounts of resource, et cetera? Um, this was a little prototype for creature construction. Um, you know, but, but restricting to the 2D case and really in that case playing with kind of the, the, the feel of the interface for creature construction. Um, and so, you know, and pr rapid prototyping of this type is great for experimenting with your mechanics, but um, prototypes don't really support reasoning about the mechanics. And what I mean by that is a lot of prototyping is you have some sub-piece of your game that you have a lot of design questions about. You build sort of a boxes and circles prototype of those mechanics and then you play it and hope for insight. Right? <laughs> and many times you build, you know, like I, I do rapid prototyping in my own practice. And it's really easy to rapid, rapidly, you know, whip, whip up something in Pi Game or whatever rapid prototyping tool you're currently using, um, play with it, and go, you know, this isn't telling me anything. Right? And what that is, well, that's a failed prototype. Right? You built something and it's not answering any design questions. Um, it's actually really hard to build prototypes that actually answer design questions. Um, so, you know, this build, play, and hope for insight approach, contemporary approach to prototyping, well, wouldn't it be nice if the prototypes actually knew something about their own mechanics um, and could answer questions directly about their mechanics? Is it possible to um, 
uh, you know, beat this game in less than 10 moves? You know, is uh, it possible to achieve a certain amount of resource within a certain time limit? Uh, are there, is there more than one way to overcome a certain obstacle? You know, these are questions that you would like to be able to learn from prototypes without maybe just having to play them hundreds and hundreds of times to hope to figure out like if there's more than one way to, to pass an obstacle, for instance. Uh, automatic uh, game design support can enable new genres. So there's some genres which really require rapid deployment in response to specific events. These are two news games. Uh, this is Bush Back Rub in response to the uh, uh, Angela Merkel, you know, unwanted back rub at the G8 meeting. You know, I don't know, this was like a year, year and a half ago. Uh, her reaction was, uh, that's pretty much the look on her face <laughs> when it happened. So, <laughs> um, and then this is uh, Bacteria Salad, which was a game from Ian Bogos that came out after um, the sort of spinach recall from last summer. <laughs> Um, so these are examples of two news games that are out there. But there's really, I mean, we've actually done a survey of news games in my group, and there's, there's really like 40 to, f you know, 30 to 40 of them in existence, right? I mean, it's a really, when I say genre, like really small budding genre. Um, and the reason why is that news games, in order to sort of pack their punch, really need to have this sort of timely and immediate response to news events. And that's just too hard to do, even for these small games. These small games can take someone a week to code in Flash, right? A week's too long. So how can you uh, sort of enable games that you really need this very immediate response to, to events? You know, educational games customized to specific learners. You know, I've got this idea for a game a day customized game. There'd be like a game a day calendar, except, uh, I mean, a, a cartoon a day calendar, except it's a game a day where I plug my cell phone to my PC. It generates a new little cell phone game for me that's about what's been going on in my day based on, for example, monitoring my email uh, traffic and web um, web patterns, right? That would be, I, I would like to play that. I'd like to experiment with that. It's impossible unless you, some, you push some knowledge of game design into the box because you just can't put a human game designer in the loop for these kinds of rapid response uh, game genres. And finally, uh, you can understand game design. Um, it, in a sense, a, a, a game, an automated game designer is an operational theory of game design. Um, you can think of it, uh, it, it sort of plays a similar role to the work that's gone on in AI in the past on story generation. And that story generation systems really tried to cash out narrative theory about what constitutes a well-formed story, um, what are the processes required to make a story. And while you can cash it out, build a program, run the program, and if you get a bad story that comes out, well, then your theory is incomplete in some way, right? So, I mean, this is the old Herb Simon, a program is a theory. Uh, uh, approach, right? And I believe in that. And so here, you know, we don't understand game design. You know, game design is still very much a craft practice. There's no game design science yet. Um, one way to push towards that is to actually start building um, rigorous, and I mean rigorous in the sense of a program, um, uh, models of game design. Um, in the interest of time, I want to talk about uh, two uh, sort of approaches to tackling the game design problem, which is a large problem, uh, automated game design problem in my lab. One is um, uh, thematic reasoning. So one of the sort of des you know, design spaces of game design is mapping real world reference onto your game, right? Like this is a science fiction world and this is a laser gun and this is, you know, where well, you put those sprites in there, but it's not just a matter of you know, visually putting in those sprites, that thematic reasoning, uh, the thematic mapping actually interacts with your game design. Like some mechanics don't make sense for different thematic maps. So um, in this space, and we've actually sort of built a prototype, this is the most well-developed work we've worked on, we took the space of WarioWare micro games, and WarioWare is great because these are, this is sort of like the, you know, the AI move towards a micro domain, right? So this is sort of like the blocks world of games. For those of you who, pl who haven't played WarioWare, WarioWare is a commercial game where you play a rapid fire sequence of like three to four second games where each game is a single action with a single mechanic, right? So this is sort of like, in a sense, it's like the grammar of game design actually kind of written out as a form of these, uh, these micro games. Um, so this is kind of like games blocks world or something. But unlike blocks world, it actually has cultural currency, right? No one was sort of excited in the general public to play blocks world or to think about blocks world and that, well, people do actually buy WarioWare and continue to buy WarioWare smooth moves for the Wii, for example, it's now a franchise. So this kind of had the double bonus of being uh, sort of rich enough 
that people that it's a real problem, but small enough that you could actually get some tractable, you know, you could get some tractability on it. So um, for this, uh, for for sort of thematic mapping, what we've done is to um, decompose kind of game, games into two levels. What we call an abstract game, which is really the thematic game, um, and that's a game with sort of high-level dynamics. Um, so it bundles thematic elements and these high-level game dynamics. So person avoiding a car. And the concept of avoiding is like for us a fundamental mechanic. There's a void, there's shoot, there's chase. These are some of the kind of fundamental mechanics the system knows about. But you can't just stick anything in there. You can't say, you know, uh, you know, um, uh, duck avoiding a fish, you might be able to say. You can't say, you know, clock avoiding an exit sign, right? That doesn't. There's some kind of semantics that's been violated, some sort of, you know, real world thematic semantics that have been violated in that particular thematic mapping onto the avoiding mechanic. Um, so those are what abstract games are. Then we have concrete games, which we've built as these sort of templated bundles of J2ME code. Um, and this is executable code that bundles dynamics, representation, and control mappings. Um, and offer sort of concrete games, uh, sort of concrete implementations, I should say, of the abstract game. So the generation problem is really generating an abstract game that makes sense in this common sense reasoning sense of makes sense um, and plug them into concrete games. Um, this is just showing how we can decompose the avoid abstract game into several different concrete instantiations. Um, how we do that sort of solve that making sense problem, I mean, this is a common sense reasoning problem, so we've been playing with how you could employ current common sense reasoning uh, techniques to reasoning about thematic mappings and games. Um, we've been playing with ConceptNet, which is uh, um, a semantic network that was mined out of the Open Mind project at the Media Lab, um, which was one of these sort of crowdsourcing approaches, you know, to have, you know, hundreds of people type in random common sense sentences about the world, then they mine them, ran sort of uh, templated uh, natural language processing over them, and pulled out a semantic network um, that's, you know, s you know, several hundred thousand nodes, 1.2, 1.3 million links. So still kind of small in the space of common sense knowledge bases, but big enough to give you some, you know, some real traction. Um, I've also in my lab in the past done work with Psych. Um, and we purposely decided, I mean, I, I actually like Psych for uh, doing when you need sort of a common sense reasoning component, but it's extremely heavyweight. Um, and for sort of rapidly exploring this thematic reasoning problem, we didn't want to use something as heavyweight as that. Uh, so now we can actually say, you know, this is the avoid game expressed as a constraint graph over common sense, over our common sense knowledge base. So we can say, you know, you can map in an avoider and an attacker as long as these semantic relationships hold between the avoider and the attacker. That the avoider is capable of receiving the action, the attack verb, that the attacker is capable of whatever that attack verb is, or the att attacker is some kind of projectile. So we're also using WordNet to give us taxonomic relationships. There's no, uh, t there's no taxonomic relationships or very little in ConceptNet. Um, and that uh, projectile is capable of receiving action attack verb. So these are the two kinds of attackers you can have. Roughly, you know, um, things like bullets satisfy this part of the and, and things like a gorilla that's directly attacking you, trying to hit you, for example, because a gorilla is capable of attack verb hit, um, would be satisfying this branch. Um, so now we can do, you know, these are basically uh, queries that we can do as graph search over concept net and start finding sensible mappings uh, to map real world themes onto our game mechanics. Uh, I'm going to wrap up at this point and take questions. I do want to uh, briefly talk about or just mention, for those of you who might be interested, that there's another branch of this work where we're actually trying to reason about the underlying mechanics. We're using the event calculus to reason about underlying mechanics, and we're using uh, uh, a version of the event calculus called discrete event calculus with circumscription. Um, and so we're trying to bring in sort of the, you know, the heavy logic machinery to give us a framework for reasoning about state evolution, dynamic state evolution, which is exactly what game mechanics are. Um, but of course, by putting it in a logical framework, we can do deduction, which is forward state evolution, abduction, so we can plan over it and find player traces, and induction, we can induce player models. And so logic gives us a really rich framework for doing all three of those. Um, and I could sort of talk about that for a long time. <laughs> so I will stop there. Thanks. So I want to take a few questions if you have time. Do I know when it was created? 
Um, I believe Santa Cruz played a role, actually. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole uh, um, uh, hack likes and rogue likes is like a big uh, subgenre now among uh, sort of retro gamers. But well, you briefly mentioned uh, about using games to uh, affect gang violence in, in LA. Just someone mm -hmm. who's now certain types of functions where, like gang violence, you can probably beat someone over the head and someone knows they're being influenced when they play the game and it's probably okay. There are the other possibilities of influencing people politically and socially without them knowing they're being influenced. And if you have a particularly intelligent and subtle game where if a person doesn't know it's happening and they play the game often enough, it could actually end up changing uh, their, their attitudes. So I'm, I'm wondering, is there any kind of research going on in that area, or is it being done? Yeah, there's, do um, there's actually a book, uh, kind of a nice overview of con uh, current work in kind of expressive games, uh, at least politically expressive games, called um, Procedural Rhetoric uh, by Ian Bogos that I would recommend. And the notion there is that um, one way of encoding rhetoric, of creating you know, a, a rhetoric, which is a point of view and an argument, right? It's not neutral, um, in a game, is to build bias simulations. So you build simulations that are biased just so that no matter how you play, the outcome you get is consistent with the point of view you want to express, right? And so um, uh, the, the book Procedural Rhetoric is kind of a nice kind of overview treatment of you know, the kinds of experiments people are doing with building, say, bias simulations as one way of encoding rhetoric into games. Um, you know, there's interesting um, kind of you know, ethical issues with you know, how should games be used for influence. Um, but they're no different than ethical issues we've already encountered for like how should, te you know, how should television be used for influence, right? When TV first came out, there were these arguments and you know, society went a certain path and now there aren't really arguments about it anymore, right? Um, so, uh, but in the game space, you know, this idea of kind of um, rhetorical games that are really trying to make an argument um, is still very new. Um, there still aren't many examples yet. And, you know, part of my work is, you know, the, the goal of my work is to kind of come up with these sort of new AI and design approaches that make it more tractable to build large numbers of these games. Because I feel like some of these questions can only be answered by really sampling the design space. You know, and so for like news games, for example, like what are all the ways that you could think of using games to comment on news events? Well, when there's only like 40 examples in existence, that's like a really sparse sampling. And so, you know, to, to get traction on that particular sub-question, how can you use games to comment on news, we need to build a lot more news games before we really understand it's too hard right now. Um, so how can, we, how can we make it more tractable? But yeah, that's, that's a great question. So we have a question from uh, Santa Cruz, actually. It says, uh, what are the prospects for growth of the game design industry, specifically in Santa Cruz? <laughs> <laughs> or the Bay uh, Area, let's say. Um, well, in the Bay Area, I mean, the Bay Area is a huge uh, nexus for games. So, I mean, that, you know, all, I mean, EA's headquarters are here. There's, uh, uh, you know, the, the Bay Area is one of the largest concentrations of, of uh, game design uh, game designers in the world, and it's up there with, I mean, the other biggies are like Montreal, Austin, Texas, um, uh, Vancouver, BC, and like the Bay Area would be basically the North American hubs for game design. Uh, within Santa Cruz proper, I'm actually on a, um, a uh, uh, design, something called the Santa Cruz Innovation and Design Board, which is a sort of city organized effort to think about how to attract more design-based businesses to Santa Cruz. Because uh, Santa Cruz, you know, particularly for like the Silicon Valley folk, Santa Cruz is considered a very desirable place to live, you know, more desirable than living in, say, Sunnyvale or Cupertino, right? Um, and, so, uh, and so there's a large number of people who live in Santa Cruz and are rich enough to live in Santa Cruz and then um, drive over the hill and commute every day. Well, why don't they have their businesses just in Santa Cruz? And so how can we attract, uh, you know, particularly design-oriented businesses like game studios uh, into Santa Cruz. So I'm involved kind of at the civic level with this um, uh, Santa Cruz board that's thinking about this. Yeah. Hey, um, so I find this uh, idea of drama management as a sort of alternative to the sort of branching uh, story structure very interesting. Um, 
But it seems to me, doesn't it sort of also have the same problem as the branching path in that if you're going to sort of you know, create this system that is capable of generating a large different number of outcomes, right? where the player's interaction makes a sort of meaningful difference in how the story turns out, you're faced with the same problem of creating all of this content, right, in order to sort of sustain all these different outcomes. And you can sort of, you know, sort of limit this problem by limiting the number of interactions. But if you want to tell sort of larger form stories mm -hmm. um, that are going to sort of tell different sort of, you know, a large number, you know, like an avid RPG, you know, mm -hmm. has like hundreds of characters, right, that you interact in. There's no way you can sort of create those type of interactions for all of them. So. Um, how does the how do you think that the drama manager sort of solves that problem? If well, it it's does? interesting that from uh, I mean, there's different ways of sort of counting the complexity of a game. One would be like the number of elements, right, like number of characters. But another would be the number of verbs you can engage in at any one moment, right? So in large open world games like the Grand Theft Auto franchise, I mean, that the whole concept of open world design is that there's this sort of large number of things you can do at any moment. But if you really count how many verbs you can engage in at any one time in Grand Theft Auto, you're talking about like five. Right um, in um, facade, uh, there are uh, the the number of discourse acts it recognizes are th there's 30 discourse acts in our, our sort of you know discourse act ontology, and they're all parameterized, and you know many of them take multiple parameters with lots of different values, and so there's actually sort of literally hundreds of things that the player can say or do as a game verb at any moment throughout the whole of facade. And so in in kind of a an interesting way, one could argue that facade is more open world you know, set in a single apartment talking to two characters than Grand Theft Auto, if you measure it in terms of sort of like, you know, verb, verb complexity over time versus kind of number of elements in the world. Um, so I think actually dealing with uh, expanding the verb complexity of games is the harder problem. Because expanding the sort of like number of characters, but you can all you can only interact with them in the super flat, you know, branching dialogue tree way or something you can in RPGs, is sort of like a that's like a mass production problem. It's like you know create a large number of simple units, right? <laughs> um, and that's actually uh, an easier problem and still an interesting problem. I mean, there, there's another project going on in my uh, lab right now that's explicitly looking at how to auto generate dialogue FSMs. And so, you know, which is the generalization of the dialogue tree, so that you could have like all these dialogue trees that are in a large RPG, like, you know, Planescape Torment to become classic, but you know, Planescape Torment is famous for the amount of dialogue in it. There's like 800,000 words of dialogue in, in Planescape Torment. Um, well, what if uh, you didn't have to hand author all those dialogue structures, but some instead hand authored kind of a backstory? in a declarative representation framework for every character. And then when you encountered a character, it dynamically generated on the fly just then a dialogue FSM for you to navigate as a function of what you've done so far in the game. Right? So, that's, so that's another um, uh, track going on in the lab right now that's specifically trying to address that content creation problem. And so you could imagine using that in combination with the drama manager. Right, because now, now you know if you're if you're if you're saying that like you know if you just have the drama manager and each story node was say like a, a conversation you could have with the character, you're right. With just the drama manager, if you have like a hundred story nodes, that's still a hundred conversations you have to create. But now you don't have to author all the inner links between them; those kind of fall out. But you still have to author those nodes. So you know there is some work going on to in a sense say now can we procedurally generate the nodes of the of the you know the, the story content nodes and procedural conversation generation is one one piece in that area. So we have uh, time for one more question right here, and then uh, he'll probably be around for a few more minutes to take uh, questions afterwards. So. Actually, <coughs> Actually, you could probably take the next question, because mine was related to his. And yeah. one, one final question back here, then. <coughs> Thank you so much, because I really want to ask this. Has anybody tried using this template or the system as a therapy tool, or as a way to have people solve their own sort of personal conflict resolution problems, or some kind of like psychoanalysis and a personal right. basis, that kind of thing? Um, people, so it often comes up when I talk about facade that, wow, this could be a great therapy tool. We did not, I, I wouldn't want to vet its therapeutic content, right? Like that's getting into, you know, so I could believe in the same way that like, you know, a good novel or good cinema can actually serve kind of a therapeutic purpose in someone's life. You know, art can be therapy, basically. I'm willing to make that claim for facade, but you know, it's not, we didn't work with uh, uh, therapists when we designed sort of the conversational interactions facade. We did a little bit. I mean, many, the, the beats are organized as social games, and the social game dynamics, we borrowed 
uh, one from conversations we had with a friend of mine who is a marriage and family counselor, but then we just sort of took it for inspiration, and then the other from pop transactional psychology, like games people play, infinite games. So, you know, we kind of lift, le leaf through games people play, and, I, you know, I love the different games in there. You know, now I've got you, you son of a bitch. You know, that's like the name of one of the games, and there's just all these basically like head games people play with each other, and so we kind of leaf through it, and it's like, oh, this is, these are great specs. You know, we could implement this one. We could implement this one, right? So we've kind of gone through those sort of uh, transactional psych head games people play and, bar and again, borrowed them for inspiration. But then, you know, we're inspired by them the way game designers are inspired by any real world domain they look at. They sort of take it and run with it. Um, I wouldn't want to claim we were trying to, you know, exactly be consistent with some like therapeutic regimen or something. But yeah, yeah, and I, I mean, going back, you know, Depression 3.0, you know, was a, was a program way back when that, uh, um, uh, that uh, was sort of a therapeutic chat agent that actually made claims for kind of reducing depression by talking with this chat character. Um, and I, I'm, I'm sort of purposely saying I'm not doing that because I don't want to make those therapeutic claims. But it would be interesting to actually work with a psychotherapist and see, you know, yeah, I don't, it would be interesting how far you could push that. I, I don't know. Well, it's a great, fascinating talk, and uh, thanks so much for coming. Thanks.